Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, as Adam said, my name is Carolyn Hinkson Jenkins of the uh, BFA Design, BFA Advertising Department at SVA. And I'm pleased to introduce the executive producer of both Family Guy and Cosmos, SVA's alumna, Carol Vallow. <laughs> When Cara was a student at SVA, we were known as the Media Arts Department. And uh, as I said before, we're now the BFA Design, BFA Advertising, where enrollment is blossomed to over 900 students and where we proudly uh, like to brag about our alumnus who have achieved wonderful accolades in the industry. And on behalf of Richard Weil, the chairman of the department for 45 plus years, uh, we welcome Cara back and congratulate her on her overwhelming success. So a little bit about Kara. She is recognized as Seth MacFarlane's longtime animation producing, producing partner and best known for her work on Family Guy, American Dad, The Cleveland Show, and Cosmos. Kara is a multifaceted producer, having created critically acclaimed series and award-winning animation and she has been nominated for five Emmys. In 2015, she won the Annie Award for Cosmos. After studying at SVA, Kara moved to LA, where she worked on the feature film, Bebe's Kids. And since then, she has produced Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at uh, Murakami Wolf, Johnny Bravo at Hanna-Barbera, Dilbert at Sony, and the Comedy Central pilot drawn together. Kara also created and produced the animation for Jessica Yu's documentary, In the Realms of the Unreal. The film was critically acclaimed and appeared in many festivals, including Sundance. Kara took over as producer of Family Guy during season three, before the show's brief cancellation. In 2004, when it was picked back up by Fox, and Kara built a standalone animation studio for 20th television and assembled 200 plus person teams in Los Angeles and in Seoul, Korea. Kara runs two popular blogs, The Haunted Library and Teen Sleuth, and is in the process of developing her own animated show and is writing a gothic novel. Please welcome Kara Vallo and the moderator for this event um, is our senior student, Silver Paul. He is a senior in animation. So let's welcome Kara and Silver Paul to the stage. Can you hear me? Whoa. Hey, guys. Hi. This theater didn't exist when I went to this school. Really? Did they not have anything? Where did you play no. your work? They had um, dormitories in the YMCA in Times Square that were horrific <laughs> that I fortunately didn't have to stay in. The one on 14th Street? No, it was, um, no, I don't think so. It was in the 30s. Where was it? Yes. Where was that? It was like on the west side. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't too savory, but they there were no no dorms. <laughs> I hear you have them now. All right, all right. So I'm just going to ask you a few questions, see what you know you can tell us, and what you can teach us about your job and your position, and a little bit about the animation industry in general. Mm -hmm. All right. So, can you tell us what attracted you to the industry in the first place? Um, I was. Attracted to animation, I wouldn't say the industry, but the genre of animation when I was a kid. Um, my grandfather, who was an immigrant from Germany, had a fascination with animation and had reels of um, old uh, Disney cartoons. And I knew pretty fairly young that I was going to be an artist of some kind and I was always painting and drawing and um, but I think that the idea of animation being able to bring my drawings to life was something that took hold really early and um, I became sort of obsessed with I my 
father took me to the Franklin Institute a couple times and they had some introductory animation classes when I was maybe nine or 10. Um, but when, when I came to SVA, I was really all over the place and um, I don't even remember what I was studying half the time, but uh, I became, um, I came into contact with um, a lot of animation students and I uh, sat in on a lot of the history of animation classes that um, made me um, even more fascinated by, by the medium and um, I decided at some point in, w during um, my tenure at S SVA that I did want to be involved in helping make uh, animated films or programs and um, after a few other jobs outside of um, when I graduated um, that weren't industry related like bartending and waitressing and stuff I, I um, made a decision to try to get a job in an animation studio and the biggest one or the only one I knew at the time was a studio called Broadcast Arts which was um, on Houston and Broadway, I think, and they did a lot of uh, animation for commercials, and I got an assistant job there, and, um, and that's really where I became um, familiarized with the industry, which was very small at the time. I, I don't know if I'd even call it an industry, um, and but having worked there for a couple years, um, I realized that there was a sort of burgeoning industry in animation that would be a viable way to make a living in um, Los Angeles. So um, I didn't want to move to Los Angeles. I grew up in Philadelphia and I loved living in New York, but I did, I moved. Um, and spent, um, I don't know, maybe close to a year temp temping and um, applying for um, assistant jobs at Disney and um, I got a job at um, Paramount Studios was opening an animation division to produce a feature animated film called Bebe's Kids which I'm sure anyone would ever remember yeah. but <laughs> you do? Mm -hmm. For real? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so I was uh, hired, I, you know, I, I actually had some experience in animation and it was a time in LA where studios, you know, major studios were taking an interest for the first time in um, creating animation departments and doing um, you know, children's animation but also feature films. And um, so I had a job, I got a job on, at the studio, it was called Hyperion, and it was a um, the animation studio for Paramount, and I was the layout department supervisor. And just from there, I worked in a series of different studios. Um, there were um, a number of independent studios. When I worked on the Ninja Turtles, it was through a through a small studio that produced it, um, and. You know, just made my way through different jobs on different shows and different studios. Okay. Well, um, I usually hear from people that uh, a specific cartoon or film really attracted them or really appealed to them and made them, you know, infatuated with, you know, animation. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything like that? Um, I think the I think the Flintstones, which is a show that I watched with uh, my brother and my father growing up, had a huge influence on me because I mean we wa we watched all the Saturday morning cartoons and I loved all those junky you know the Scooby Doo and everything but the Flintstones always stuck out to me because it was the one show my father would laugh at because it was you know weirdly supposed to be an adult animated show um, right, but right. it did. Yeah, you know, they had like cigarette commercials all over the place. So. They did, yeah, yeah. The, but the show itself is so incredibly tame, and um, by you know today's adult standards, obviously, like Family Guy, it, it it seems sort of 
um, ridiculous that we were ever that innocent that that was a adult show, but um, you know, it didn't have a great artistic value, I guess, but I thought it was um, funny and I could watch the episodes over and over. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, we saw all the Disney 2D um, features when I was a kid, and this was before, you know, everything was CG, and so that's <laughs> what I still have in my mind as animation. Is right. Okay, so would you say that, you know, your transition to the West Coast was, you know, straightforward and easy? I mean, for me, I think I wouldn't be able to be so, you know, forward going about that. I, I might be a little bit reluctant at first, but. I, yeah, I'm not really sure why I wasn't reluctant. I didn't really know anybody. I knew a few people in L.A., um, but I, um, at Broadcast Arts, I was um, a production manager on a pilot that they were trying to do for NBC, a, a, um, a primetime pilot that was called, see if you know this one, the Jackie Bison Show. Frank remembers this one. Um, that didn't go. It was in, in, insane. Um, but they did an element of the post-production at NBC in LA, and um, I went out to LA, and I, you know, it seemed like completely glamorous and mysterious, or palm tree. I mean, it just seemed like unlike anything, right. any place I'd been. But I, I didn't really. I don't know. I don't know why I moved out there. I mean, I think it was it, it was really career based. I, I didn't. I wanted to stop working at Broadcast Arts. I was not having a great experience um, towards the end there, and I felt I needed to move really far away. <laughs> and um, I just saw that there might be opportunities there that there weren't in New York. Like I didn't really want to work on commercials. I wanted to do programming and work on television shows and do um, do use animation as like storytelling as opposed to selling um, products and mm -hmm. I, I, yeah I did then so I never came back California was always the place to go if you want to be an animator it was then yeah, yeah. I mean I get and I think it probably still is I, I I'm you know I would I always thought I would be moving back to New York um, at some point but um, I had success in my career, and I, you know, I ended up working on things that I that I liked, and I didn't see those same opportunities in New York. My family all lives on the East Coast. I didn't love being out there. I still don't. Um, but um, it's you know, it's easier to live there than in New York, and um, you know, and I, I would. I would love, I would love it if there were a more, you know, more of a commercial industry for animation in New York. But I, you know, I don't, I don't think, I don't think we're unionized here. I think in California mm -hmm. there is a union, but you'll mm -hmm. definitely get paid less if you do the same job here than out there. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't. I think it's the at, at some point in the you know mid late eighties the the studios really started to recognize um, animation. So it wasn't relegated to these individual, these independently run um, animation studios. So, you know, Sony and Fox and Paramount all started, all wanted to have their own divisions and they were all in Los Angeles. So that's where it was happening and that's where, you know, I well, have to be. Well, you definitely made a lot of success and would you, like, how difficult would you say it was to climb that ladder to producer? Well, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't that difficult. I mean, it, I think it was a time that the industry was, you know, in its infancy out there. So when I came out, I already had a good, pretty good basis in, anim in animation. And so when I got my first job, it was, it was, a, it was a good one. And I, um, I think as an intelligent person, <laughs> I you know who worked really hard, I was able to um, uh, be successful in all the different 
jobs I had. You know, and I had jobs in all the different departments and coordinating all the different areas of animation. And um, it's, I think that, like, one of the, one of the strangest things about working in the animation industry in Hollywood is that it's still to um, live action producers and studio heads seem like such a foreign process. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I see it even at Fox where they've been producing The Simpsons for uh, like 30 years, but it's still so intimidating to them and they don't want to really learn the process. And so it becomes you know, they can't, and it's also they can't control it the way they do a live action show where the executives are on the set giving notes. They, they can't do that in animation. So it, um, you know, it's given a lot of autonomy to Seth and myself when we started our studio to be able to do what we wanted to do without a lot of undue influence. Um, and, you know, there, and, to be able to sort of take advantage of other people's um, fear of mm. the genre or their right. inability to grasp it. Because for me, it's, you know, it's animation. It's like an as producing it is not difficult. It mm -hmm. sort of works on an assembly line. <laughs> you know, if it's a traditional show like Family Guy, if, you know, if something like Cosmos is, you have to sort of think about it completely different and set up an, a whole other kind of process and pipeline. Okay. Well, what exactly are you responsible for as a producer? Like how um, much influence do you have? On um, Family Guy and American Dad and The Cleveland Show, Seth's television uh, animated shows. I don't have nothing to do with his movies. Um, I was just put in charge of setting up a studio and a pipeline mm. and a, um, you know, the crews um, for every aspect of it. And then, um, you know, making the shows that Seth wanted to make where he was, you know, very um, exacting about a lot of very specific things in the show, um, it, which I think sets it apart from um, some other like shows like The Simpsons and King of the Hill. Like it, Family Guy's so much a sort of authored vision of this one person and he had very, you know, just down to eye movements and timing and framing and, um, you know, it was cha challenge to mm -hmm. sort of give him the show he wanted every week and he's not really involved day to day anymore, but it's still, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, on Cosmos, I, I was not actually executive producer. I was hired to create the animation for what is substantially a a live action and effects show. Um, and we, um, they wanted to, and for anyone who's familiar with the original Cosmos with Carl Sagan, um, they did the narrative portions of the show as historical recreations with like actors with, you know, mutton chops pasted on and at, you know, and costumes. And um, Seth, who was a uh, executive producing the show thought that that would be kind of hokey now that standards are so much higher and you know like Downton Abbey you know they, they are, our standards for that kind of stuff are, are, are higher so he sort of made the decision to do it in animation which um, I was not really on board with at first I felt like I couldn't do that um, source material justice, I mean, it was Cosmos, and it was something that was like, um, like important watching in my household growing up, and um, I had to somehow come up with, uh, you know, an idea of how it would look and how it would work within the context of like a, a science show, um, which was, you know, difficult. I didn't want to be like laughed out of town, and it had to be crafted in a, you know, sort of specific way. So that I was much more hands-on, and that was, um, oh, I had done, created the animation for a, a documentary um, a number of years ago called In the Realms of the Unreal, and it was sort of a similar puzzle kind of figuring out. It was about a, a painter, and the director wanted to bring the characters in the painting to life, and I was also 
like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I was a fan of this painter's work. And um, so, so f figuring out a way to not um, mess with the paintings and, um, you know, ended up using After Effects to sort of, where I didn't have to um, recreate any aspect of the paintings. We could right. sort of cut and paste them. And that's sort of what, um, I took some of that into Cosmos. Um, so you have that, that puppet animation style. Yeah. Just like manipulating. Yeah, figures, exactly. Right? And I thought like for Cosmos, like it couldn't, the, the, the producers of the show kept sort of trying to lean towards very realistic because they were trying to replicate what was real people in the old show. And so they kept steering towards more and more sort of realistic style characters. And that was just like, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't wrap my head around that. It couldn't look like Disney, you know, Disney character. It had to be something that worked within a sort of that cosmic dreamy, you know, idea of, of Cosmos. And um, uh, so we ended up using a, a very like, uh, simplified style for the characters themselves and then um, a more sort of nuanced um, uh, painterly style for for the background to sort of create a whole sort of different world that um, that would work within that show. It was difficult and it was you know it was a, a huge amount of responsibility. Very cool. Well I think you only really have time for one more question so I just want to mm -hmm. ask <laughs> well, before we before we give the audience okay. a chance to walk up to the mics, but I just want to ask if you have any advice for anyone trying to get into the industry. Um, for animators, I mean, you know, honestly, it's. I think I work on. I produce one of the few traditional shows where we anim like we um, maybe six or seven years ago we finally switched to digital tablets and um, stopped using paper and scanning, but our shows are drawn, um, hand-drawn in, in Korea, and um, I think there's sort of a misconception that things are um, put into a computer <laughs> and spit out, but our, you know, we, it, that's not the way it's done, and I, um, I feel like there's a, me giving advice to students today is sort of disingenuous because it, technology's <coughs> taken over. I mean, I don't, I'm too old to have to appreciate even the 3D shows and the oh, Pixar movies and stuff. I can't. I don't know. I'm I, so I feel like my advice 10 years ago would have been to, um, you know, learn and get a job doing physical layouts on a show and really learning how to animate. But I'm not really sure what what it is anymore. I mean, I, I think that's still applicable advice today. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, they still, I mean, you still take two, are there still like layout classes? Like sure. character layout? and we do, we do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's always great. And most of the people I, who are directors and on my shows have a um, background in, in animating. You know, they're older mm. and it just lends itself so much to um, knowing how to time. And, right. But I, I don't know what, you know, how many other jobs they're going to be doing, you know, doing that kind of thing. I think, like, Harmony and, um, like, we did um, Cosmos and Flash. If we were mm. going to do another season, we I would probably use Harmony or I think that's a little outdated now. But After Effects, I think, is always a great thing to know. Okay. Um, and, I mean, there there are a lot of people doing animation now. TV, you know, television and movies. There's a lot of opportunity. Um, unfortunately, they I think they're mostly in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's what it seems like. Wow. Well. All right. Well, we actually have <laughs> someone in the audience. Hello. Hey. Testing. Hello. Testing one two three. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm Jeremy. Um, I'm uh, also in the animation department here at SVA, fourth year, graduating. Um, I just want to first, before I ask my question, I just want to say that um, I know you said before that uh, what inspired you to get to get you into animation was Flintstones. Um, I just want to just say, uh, personally for me, what inspired me to get myself into it was Family Guy, Cleveland Show. 
and I don't, I don't think uh, without your contributions, I wouldn't be here today. So I just oh, want to thank you, you so much that. for oh, that. that. You're very welcome. Absolutely. And um, I was just curious because um, I know you gave advice uh, if you want to get it for animators, if they want to uh, get into the business. But for someone that's interested in storytelling, script writing, what advice mm -hmm. do you have for that? Well, there, you know, in in the animation industry, there, in the the world of Family Guy and The Simpsons and um, the prime time shows, they're very separate entities. The people who draw the storyboard artists and the directors and the writers. Um, in my studio, we're at least housed in the same. We, we all work together. And the, on the other shows, it's um, there are in separate um, parts of town. And they're very separate. It's sort of the way it was set up on The Simpsons, I, I believe. Um, but on at a Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon and m most of the other shows and most of the kids' shows, or not, not even the kids' shows, but the whatever you call those shows like Adventure Time that, that are on now that are sort of appeal to everybody. Because um, I worked at Hanna-Barbera for a number of years and that um, storytelling that really was generated by the artist. Um, very different um, process. And that's where I met Seth because we worked on Johnny Bravo and he was a writer slash storyboard artist. Like he directed and wrote episodes. And um, that is still um, relevant in, in a lot of the studios. I think, you know, the family, the, the shows that are on now are s sort of dinosaurs in that they're very se separated. Um, but, you know, I've always really enjoyed, and I know this is the way this Flintstones was made, that storytelling through the storyboard process and the artist, they're, they're just, you know, that's, um, that would be like uh, the route to take at any of those any of those studios besides Fox, really, um, that are doing animation. Um, anything that doesn't have like the adult-driven, script-driven uh, process is. I mean, I, it's it's really storyboarding, right? And telling the story through 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 those means and. If you can do that, that's that's like the the most. I, I mean, I, I still think that storytelling is the most important aspect of it. That's sort of what I want, like to do. And um, you know, again, unfortunately, Family Guy's not a good example of that. Um, <laughs> it's more like um, a live action sitcom. In some cases. Yeah. In some instances. In some instances, yeah. I mean, there there are a lot of there are. There's a, a large component of Family Guy where that's not really the case, where there are um, montages or song sequences that are very driven by the the directors and storyboard artists. Like, you know, we did a the Dis a Disney parody uh, sequence, one, one. and that was that was a very different process. Even though the song was existing, the telling that story in that song was really completely up to the artists and. Um, a lot of times there are, uh, I mean, we, there are a lot of visual gags, obviously, in, in Family Guy that, um, that are really, are, they can be words on a script, but they're really told by the person that's drawing them. You know, silly things like, uh, you remember an episode where Peter's like trying to scrape a frog off a wall? Oh. <laughs> like something like that was purely out of the mind of the director of the episode and who drew it. Like, you know, that it could maybe was a one sentence thing in the script that became a whole, you know, bit through some someone's drawings. Yeah. But just one thing, because I noticed that um, sometimes like the story changes like throughout the the process. I think mm -hmm. I remember watching the DVD. Uh, or some I remember. Uh, I think it was before the Cleveland show came to. Uh, I think it was like with Cleveland, Loretta, they were getting back mm -hmm. together, but they ended up getting back together at the end. Mm -hmm. So was that something like, it, does that happen often, like when uh, the story changes and the things have to uh, mm. be rewritten and uh, reanimated, or is it like? No, 
I'm trying to think if there are any other instances. We try to keep it um, consistent. There's sometimes, yeah. occasionally, it, something will falter in the script, but someone will, who really knows the show, will catch it and say, "Yeah, we killed that." James Woods off in, you know, another episode, and they can decide to bring him back if they want, but we all know he's dead. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah, I was not an advocate of that, bringing him back, but. All right, well, thank you very much. Sure. Is there anyone else? Well, if you have a question, just walk up to the mic. Oh, sorry. Okay. Kara, first of all, uh, thanks for making the trip out. Um, and second of all, great job. I think the animation looked brilliant on uh, Cosmos. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. A big hand. You're working with Seth McFarland, and you know, you're working with this incredible creative team of people, and I'm sure there's, everybody's got lots of ideas, and everybody wants to put their fingerprints on a show like Family Guy. Can you... Uh, and again, especially coming in the animation um, department here, we spend so much time working with our designs and working with our animation. We rarely get the chance to talk with an executive producer. Can you elaborate a little bit more on your job as an executive producer? And maybe also in comparison to what a line producer does. And then my final question for you would be, in the course of a given day or a given project, how do you feel most creatively fulfilled in the work that you're doing as an uh, executive producer? Well, the job, my jobs are, are on Family Guy and American Dad, the Cleveland show, very different than, say, on Cosmos. Um, again, my, I, when I, when Family Guy got picked up after its um, cancellation, it was up to Seth and myself to sort of build something that that would it actually got picked up around the same time they picked up American Dad, and I was on the lot at Fox producing their animated um, presentations from which they were going to choose um, what they wanted to pick up. I, I had done a couple of them, and American Dad was one of them, and Family Guy was still actually not picked up yet again, and. Um, they decided kind of within a week to, that they were going to pick up 35 episodes of Family Guy and American Dad. And we were supposed to go right into production. Now, when Family Guy had been canceled several years prior to that, um, they, I remember, like, I usually, at other studios, I archived the episode, you know, the materials just for whatever reason. And... Fox told me not, not to even bother because they were never going to be in the business of animation again. And I, I ended up archiving, just do, putting a, it just seemed like I couldn't just walk away. So we, I put a little box together with a, for each episode and I stored them in my garage and Seth's garage. So when um, the show got picked up again, that's really all we had. Like, they didn't, we didn't have a digital database. They hadn't kept any materials. They'd given away all their animation desks. Um, so m my job became setting up, um, well, finding a space and setting up a studio and developing a pipeline that would work for the studio but also work for what Seth wanted. He had very specific ways of um, working and things that he wanted and a way in which to produce that show, which is was not very, it's difficult. It's not the easy show to produce primarily because it is so much a, 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 a product of one person, really unlike The Simpsons or King of the Hill that all have their, you know, their authors and their vision, but um, it, um, and I needed to staff, um, I had to find like 400 artists, and um, it was I was it was fortunately at a time where <laughs> the Simpsons I, I knew all the animators in town, um, and a, most of the ones that 
I sort of wanted were working on The Simpsons, which was also a Fox show, and they the actors were um, holding out. They weren't strike, so a lot of the artists were laid off, and and I knew it was going to be an issue when I hired a bunch of these people, and I knew a lot of layout artists that were, would, you know, the directors in The Simpsons pretty much stayed there forever, and uh, a lot of really talented animators that were stuck in the layout department, and I hired a lot of them um, to be board artists and directors just on the basis of how um, talented I knew they were, even at layout, and I, I got in huge trouble by, by The Simpsons. Um, but I built, you know, staff, and I just had to make, I, you know, produce this episodes of the show the way that Seth saw them and wanted them, and it was, you know, difficult. And um, so I hired the artist, put writing staff together, and um, built studio. You know, I had went through a couple different studios in Korea, and finally. Um, I think maybe in the fourth or fifth season, found uh, sort of two fledgling studios that I worked with to help build um, uh, really great teams. And they're, they're really like our, you know, sister studios, and they're not sweatshops. They are exactly like our studio, and um, probably with better health care. Um, and, you know, I, I, for a while, I for a number of years, maybe five or six years, a very hands-on with every aspect of the show from, um, you know, Seth and I would look at every script, every board, every design, and then that sort of, you know, faltered a bit and my, um, I have line producers that work under me that sort of do more of the day-to-day -day handling of it. With Cosmos, I, um, you know, again, I, I was um, meant to design and create something that was um, a very different process. And, you know, I miss uh, the creative aspect in, you know, in my day-to-day -day work, you know, work on Family Guy. And, you know, occasionally we'll have something that's really exciting come in, like some musical sequence or something that we can do that's special. Um, and that sort of keeps the, the animators and the artists going when we do things like that. Um, but you know, like any job, we've been doing it 12 years and it can be a bit of a grind. And it's not like, you know, all fun and games. <laughs> um, you know, when when they decided they wanted to do the spinoff, the Cleveland show spinoff, that was, um, again, enormous undertaking, trying to build a whole other team and, you know, make a show around sort of a thin concept of a character. And, um, but, yeah, it's hard to keep um, thinking creatively uh, when, you, when you're producing the same show for 12 years. I think we have time for two more questions, so go ahead. Kyle Mazza from UNF News. Uh, nope. Kyle Mazza from UNF News. Thank you, Kara, for allowing me to ask sure. my question. Of course. Um, first, I want to ask you, um, what is it like coordinating with Seth and everyone else on your team? And also, I want to ask you, some, some jobs are very stressful. Now, I want to ask you, does it ever become stressful for you working on several different projects? And if so, how do you deal with that stress if it comes about? Um, it was very stressful for maybe the first four, five, six years. And um, almost, uh, you know, untenably so. Uh, particularly, when, you know, when Seth was very involved in the show and he's, again, very precise and exacting about what he wanted. Um, how I handled it was ultimately going to a psychiatrist who told me to get a hobby outside of work. Um, and it was, um, I started horseback riding, which I did as a kid. And I, um, and so I ride 
every morning before work. So I had you know sort of that work mania thing, and there was so much going on, and Seth had so much stuff going on, and I felt an enormous pressure with him there to um, everything to be perfect all the time. Um, that that stress really has gone away. Um, the hobby helped, but. It's, you know, he separated himself from the day-to-day -day runnings of the show. I mean, he looked, looked at everything and would come in my office if, like, an eye direction on a pa storyboard panel was wrong. It, like, one panel out of 100 episodes, you know. It's, it was stressful. I, I was responsible, apparently, for everything that went wrong. And, um, but, you know, since he's gone on to his movie career, it's... There's not that, um, there's no one there that cares as much as he did, obviously. And um, so it's much less stressful, but much less challenging at the same time. Um, so, you know, I'm, part of me is glad to not have the stress, but a part of me is like, you know, misses, misses the, the challenge of it. And um, uh, when, when, Cosmos got dumped on my lap. That was like something that ultimately really sort of kept me going for another two years because it was extremely challenging and, um, uh, you know, creatively stimulating. But, you know, there's, there are always things that come up that make it sort of like interesting again or challenging, but not, not so much that it's, that it's an impediment to my life anymore. You know, eventually I'll take something on that will be that again, but it's sort of, um, you know, it's become a, 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 a job. We have one more question up here, and I know you were just telling me, Kara, that, um, that mm -hmm. the episode that we, the 10 minutes of the episode we just saw was made probably about two years ago, and you don't necessarily remember it, <laughs> but we do have a question related to that. Okay. Thank you so much. My name is Muktasan Abdurazak. I'm not a student or anything, but uh, I love Family Guy and I love Cosmos. This particular segment was prognosticated for me, and I'll tell you why. I asked him when this cartoon was made. He said it was two years ago. And there was a scene, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the political circus that's going on today with that idiot Trump. Uh, yeah, there very, was a political scene, because he seems not to like women for some reason, mm -hmm. and I thought it was strange when he was going into the asylum, it said, for lunatics and menstruators, and it immediately set my mind there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, so, I remember uh, that So my question line. was going to be, did Trump inspire that? But then he told mm -hmm. me that it was made two years ago. So it was actually prophetic. You might actually have time for another question, um, because it's a comment, more a comment than a question. Well, yeah, no, it, it's a good one, actually. I mean, I, you know, I write a political blog, so I'm, I'm entrenched in the political scene probably too much, but I am exaggerating a little bit when I say two years, but it takes us about a year and a half to make an episode, so we can't really have anything that's too relevant, it, unlike you know South Park. It, we have a ridiculously drawn out schedule, um, pr primarily because the writers are allowed to do so many rewrites. And it, again, it was a system that was set up at Fox and The Simpsons, and it, it's not, it's not the best system. Um, but I feel, I mean, if I'm gonna be really honest, the f show is written by 28 white men um, that have a tendency to make s jokes like that. And if I go as far as to, because Trump is running for President. These guys are writing a comedy where, I mean, a menstruation thing could be a joke. It, you know, my, my personal feelings, uh, you know, are, I, I'm not crazy about the, you know, the amount of those types of jokes, but I'm not writing it. I, I certainly give my two cents, and I, I, I feel like they have um, jokes like that of, have become more common since Seth is not involved in the script. Like he, there were always offensive jokes. They were usually had some sort of context that made them funny and not offensive. And you know, I, I don't find that to be the case all the 
time now, but um, I was telling someone earlier, that's why I'm sort of more of a fan right now of American Dad. Um, the joke, because I, I get I get a little tired of the mean jokes, I, I guess, and the and targeted at women and other people. No, no problem. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Silver. And thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming.